Hello everybody. Welcome to Marriage of the Single Lady of your Bible study teacher Zandra Wilson. And you know what? I had went ahead and prepared a whole nother lesson um, for tonight. And let me just tell you how amazing the Holy Spirit is. I'm like starting to prepare this lesson, even started this live video. And so the Spirit was like, you didn't finish part um, two from effective communication from two weeks ago because last week you know, I, I wasn't here. I wasn't here teaching. So, and the spirit, the spirit is just so good. I mean, literally, I have prepared an entire lesson, but I did not want to shortchange you. I'm gonna go back to effective communication and pick up where I left off. Oh my gosh, I did not want to shortchange you. So, God is so good. Thank you, Holy Spirit. So, I was all set to teach about codependency. So, I guess we'll pick that up next week. So, I did not finish my lesson dealing with effective communication. So, I'm gonna give you a little. Um, uh, like a mini um, um, tutorial going back over or like a rehash of what we've done, what we did a couple weeks ago, and then I can continue with this lesson. Okay? So again, I'm your Bible study teacher, Zandra Wilson. This is Marriage and the Single Lady, workshop series number 14, class number five, part two of effective communication. So if you can bow for a word of prayer. Father God, I thank you. <laughs> Father God, I thank you. I went ahead and was teaching this was prepared to teach this other class, but your spirit spoke to me, Father God, and was like, mm -mm, you didn't finish teaching part two of effective communication. So I thank you for that, Lord, um, that um, I did not um, go into another lesson without completing what you told me to teach initially, God. So I thank you, Lord. I ask that you bless the hearers and uh, the, um, the doers, Father God, that's coming in to listen to this word, Father God. So the ones who are going to hear it, and God bless those who are going to do it. Father, I pray for every ear, God, that they're attentive, Father, remove Zandra and just allow the Holy Spirit to speak, Father God. Let the Spirit rest, rule, and abide in me, God, in everything that comes out of my mouth. God, I pray, Father God, that it's you. If it's not you, Father God, you know what you do best. Shut my lips. Let your Spirit speak to me, God, that I can make my wrong right. I thank you, and I do not take this for granted, that you've given me a platform that I'm able to teach your word. Father, I have to serve with myself. So, God, I just ask that you clean me up mind, body, and soul, Father God, that I'm presentable to you and to your people. Father, I pray for my YouTube family. I thank you so much for them as well from all over the world, God, with their comments um, as, uh, as they're watching these lessons. So, Father, I thank you for them. I lift all of this up to you in the mighty name of Jesus. And God, please uh, allow the, the word to go forth. And God, that it don't go on deaf ears. And Father God, for those who are hearing it, that they become doers. Thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, well, welcome, welcome, welcome. So let's just do um, a little bitty, um, um, let me go back. So what we did initially was godly communication requires that we turn from evil and do good in our walk. So we started off with, with 1 Peter 3 and 11. So the whole point of this lesson was um, godly communication. And godly communication is not always just what comes out of our mouth. That was the main point that the Spirit wanted me to get across to you guys. It's not just what comes out of our mouth. It's everything from our body language to um, what we do for people and what we don't do. Because a lot of times we think doing evil is what we're doing. It's a lot, you know, it's what we're not doing. Withholding love, withholding goodness from people. So we started off with that. Um, we talked about a couple of different things. Number one was godly communication requires turning from evil and our actual walk. We started with that. Then we went into godly communication requires doing good in our walk. Okay, so remember the first part was turning from evil in our walk. So of course, if you're if you're doing, you, you guys know, if you're walking um, against what God would have, what God would say, and at the end of the day, it's about the heart. It's about that heart. It's about the heart. I can't not reiterate that enough. It is the heart. So turn it from evil. So if you're uh, actively doing stuff that's evil, God is like turn from that. Second part, it requires doing good in our walk um, as we're walking with God. Um, and then we got into a couple of different other points where it's harmonious. What does that look like? What does doing good look like in, in this effective communication? It's harmonious. The Greek word means of the same mind or attitude. So if it's harmonious, it has to be of God, right? Um, sympathetic. We need to have a sympathetic heart affected by like feelings. So we need to be able to um, have a heart for people. It boils down to having a heart for people. And then um, that's where I stopped. I never got past sympathetic. So then we're going to jump into brotherly love. And then we can do a whole, um, you know, like a, 
a, just a mini uh, mini rehash of what we've talked about so far. So number three is brotherly. The Greek word is Philadelphia. Of course, you're butchering it, um, which means brotherly love. And that's where we get our city in Philadelphia and Pens um, Pennsylvania, Philadelphia from. It's the city of brotherly love. It points to the fact that as believers, we are members of the same family. Come on now. Your wife is not just your wife. She's your sister in Christ. Your believing children are also your brothers and sisters in Christ. Someone has wisely observed that we should treat our family members like we treat our guests mm. and treat our guests like family. So it's all one circle. The comment is based on the fact that we are often rude and considerate towards those we live with, yet we are very nice to the dog, um, people that's not a part of the family, et cetera, et cetera. So let's talk about this for a minute. Brotherly love. Again, we're talking about effective communication. What type of um, message are you sending your children if you mistreat your husband? What type of message are you sending them if you're back talking, backslide, backbiting um, husbands? If you're um, uh, being mean to your wife, saying you know, being um, rude, um, hitting on her, or she hitting on you? What type of message are we sending our children? What type of message are we sending? you know, just to the world in general. Now, we're supposed to be believers, and so the common thread is, well, God know my heart. We throw that term around like it's grass or paper. Yeah, God knows your heart. That's why he wants to change it. That's why he wants it to be conformed. That's why he wants you to be transformed. We cannot stay there and live in God knows my heart or whatever. Then wonder why our lives are just jacked up. We look up, we're 60 and we're 70, and we have lived a life that we're not fulfilled. We're not happy. We're miserable. And we feel like we've been shortchanged. And we feel all of these different things um, we have not fulfilled in our own lives because of how we've treated people. And a lot of times how we've allowed people to treat us. By not, we've allowed people to treat us in any kind of way in front of our children. And we've set an example that way as well. So we need to know scripture. We need to have an intimate relationship with God to even know when to say something, when not to say something, when to go to scripture, when is the time to just sit back and just pray for the person. A lot of times we don't know what to do because we're so caught up in our feelings. So we just react out of anger. We react because we don't like something. We react because we don't want to get played or whatever. And other times people do not react out of fear. They do not react because they don't, they're afraid of what may happen or what the consequences may be, which is going back to codependency. And we're going to talk about that next week and what the Bible has to say about codependency. But effective communication uh, with brotherly, it is about how we treat others and how we allow others to treat us. So your guests, you should treat like family. Your family, you should treat like guests. So bottom line, you're supposed to treat everyone the same, pretty much. We're supposed to treat everyone the same, okay? The behavior of brotherly love opens the doors for wholesome verbal communication. So again, it's not necessarily what's coming out of your mouth. It's your actions, how you are treating your brothers and sisters in Christ. And a lot of times, I don't know, we, we think we're hiding it or we're thinking, I don't know, we're phony Christians, saints of God. I get we fake it till we make it. But a lot of us need to stop and look at our hearts. Stop and just, we have to stop and just look at our hearts. And if we have people who we're in prayer with, they can even help us if we can't see because everyone has a blind spot. But a lot of us know the intent. Why are you doing what you're doing? And you really, you know when something's not right. Come on now, somebody. You know when something inside of you is not right. A lot of times we're mad at God and we take it out on, our, on the people that surround us because of how we're going to take it out on God. So we mistreat those around us. There's consequences to that. You know, so, and it starts with myself. Trust me. Um, looking in the mirror, a lot of times it's painful. Um, and it can be hard, but it's necessary in order to grow. A lot of us are deceived. Oh my gosh, including myself, we've all just been deceived. You know, we thought that we were supposed to, it could be anything, something as simple as we were supposed to purchase this or we're supposed to support that or we're supposed to go here, believing that God has told us to do it and then come to find out it was our own flesh. Well, we were just duped, right? We, you know, it goes back to the intent, which God honors the heart. So if your heart was right, 
you know, think, you know, God, please forgive me. I thought that's what you wanted me to do. We can move on. But it always, it goes back to our heart and what's in our hearts and what the, the, the whole point of, of, um, of how we're treating people. So again, effective communicating is really about a heart issue. We can only fake it for so long. Eventually, you need to actually be that person. You know what I'm saying? You should be growing into that person. And if it's authentic and if you're really putting in the work, you will. You eventually grow into that person. So again, that's a brotherly love. So kind-hearted, tender-hearted, compassionate. In the New Testament, this word is only used here and in Ephesians 4.32. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. The root word, which comes from the Greek word for bowels, is often used to mean compassion. Okay, so kind-hearted can mean compassion. The idea is to have deep gut feelings for the other person. Now, a lot of us do not have that. We're going to come back to that in a minute. Okay, I don't know if there is any difference between kind-hearted and sympathetic, okay? Uh, but both words have an emotional element. Christian behavior must go beyond cold duty. Others should sense that we genuinely care for them from our hearts. If family members feel our tender concern, it opens the way for healthy verbal communication. Now, I have to say, um, it's hard for us. Some of some people care about us, but we don't. We're being real. Um, and sometimes people expect more of you than um, what you may be willing to give. Now, you can genuinely care about somebody. Now, how you may show your caring may be not how they, they may not think you care. But it could be some issues within them. You know what I'm saying? Because some people want you, for instance, um, like I have a, a, this guy I know that's an Aspie. So one of the things he says with his Asperger's is that um, don't think because I'm not showing emotion or showing like I'm not ah, crying or falling out that that doesn't mean that I don't care. You know, and of course, he has a syndrome. It's a neurological disorder. So, of course. They show it naturally different, but we can apply that to our brothers and sisters. Don't just go. We don't know unless we ask. So you cannot just assume someone doesn't care because they don't react the way that you would react. A lot of times we put our emotions and feelings on the other person because uh, we would do A, B, C, F, and G. We are expecting them to do A, B, C, F, and G. Some people don't know how to react. Some people have a nervous laugh. Some people do, um, you know, make, for instance, um, people, some people have a hard time with death. So... An example would be if someone told me about a loved one, I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, that's how I hate Zandra react. But someone else who's uncomfortable, they make a whoo, they, girl, well, at least you know they in heaven. Or um, they may make a joke or crack or say something that's insensitive. It may come across as insensitive because they don't really know what to say. You know what I'm saying? So we have to stop with um, putting people what we would do on someone else and because they don't act that way that then something is wrong with them okay so thinking that something is wrong with that person because they don't act the way that we would act so that's very important that we know that okay so that goes back to being kind-hearted so again we started with brotherly love now kind-heartedness humble in spirit okay jesus described himself as humble in heart as matthew eleven twenty nine, 29 using a cognate word Pagan writers of biblical times saw this equality saw this quality as a weakness. A lot of times we view that kind of stuff as a weakness, right? But Christians elevated it as a virtue. In our day, many Christians have reverted back to the pagan view. Since many Christians' books deals with relationships say they need greater self-esteem or to love others. So some people think they just need to have all of the stuff in order to show love, right? But the Bible clearly teaches that esteeming ourselves more than we esteem others is, a, is at the root of our conflict. So, let me just keep going. Helping the Philippian church work through some conflicts, Paul says in Philippians 2.3, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Now, I use an example for myself. Um, one of the things I'm trying to do is buy property. And of course, normally when people buy property, you want to get a property that you want. You want the property, you want to decorate it how you want, just your own flesh, right? You're not even really thinking about it necessarily as a spiritual thing. Um, in my case, God has told me that um, the property that I get, before I even, he told me this years ago, and I've owned property before, um, that it would be a house of, uh, it would be a, I call it a prayer mansion. 
So it would be a house of prayer, worship, um, like retreats, things of that nature. That is not something that was on my radar. That is not something that I even desired to do. So God had to prepare me for years to get my mindset as to that's the um, that's what he has for me, right? So my home, and he moved me into a home that's like that because um, I'm not a communal person per se, but he's moved me in like, okay, I'm going to need you to do these things. And as he's prepared me, I'm like, wow, it's such an honor and a privilege to be able to open up your home to bring, because your home is being a house of peace, to be able to bring people in for a prayer for, for these three-day retreats. That's bottom line what it is. Three days of relaxation, prayer, and hearing from God. I've been on them. I've given them. And so now he's preparing me for that. So it's like, okay, Lord. So now when I'm looking at property, it's more so like what can be a retreat haven for people that's coming to this home. Before I wasn't looking at no property like that. I was looking at it, well, what's going to please Zandra? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, this is what I want. And this is how, um, and, 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 you know, generally it would be much smaller, clearly. But God has his plans and he's um, asked me and he's preparing me for that. But that's just to give you an example when we say our lives are not our own and when God is preparing us. And it's something that I didn't think that I would enjoy or would want to do. But I'm like, okay, Lord, what an amazing responsibility uh, and a privilege that you've given me to be able to open up my home um, and have these retreats. So that's just an example. So do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, Regard one another as more important than yourselves. To have harmonious relationships, we must lower our estimate um, of ourselves. And this is Romans 12, 10 and 1 Peter 5, 5. High regard for myself causes me to refuse to admit my wrongdoings. Come on now. A lot of times as parents, um, someone had uh, posted, I believe here on Facebook, like should parents apologize to children? I didn't grow up under that. Uh, and it would have been a time when I would have been like, no, you know, that's the child, you're the parent. But as I've gotten more mature in Christ, absolutely. Because if you, you raise your children to be responsible adults, we all make mistakes. You can go to your child, so you're teaching them. So when they make a mistake, to go and apologize. Or to say that wasn't the best decision. Or I did the best that I could. So it's okay to apologize to your children. Or to someone, even if you are a mentor. Because it doesn't necessarily have to be your child. It could be someone that you're mentoring. And a lot of times I even find myself in that predicament, like, man, you feel like embarrassed or I shouldn't say anything. You know, you, you know, we kind of put a, uh, put ourselves higher than what we ought to be instead of saying that we apologize or I messed up. You know what I'm saying? And that's a really, really bad with people. Sometimes I shouldn't say it's not with all people. It's a certain personality type. But in leadership positions to just say, I apologize, man, I, I messed up. A lot of people, we just, you know, so I make a point. I learned that from my mom um, is to, if I'm wrong, if I'm wrong, if I've been proven wrong. Nowadays, too, I just look, just to keep the peace. Look, I apologize, let's keep it moving. Because some of this is just not even worth it. It's just not even worth it. But to apologize to people. And a lot of times it doesn't even matter if you're right or wrong. If you've offended the person, I apologize. That was not my intent, and then we can move on. Now, if you're dealing with a person that's completely all, they're always offended. Because you have some people that you can't do anything. Nowadays, everyone's offended about everything. That's where another struggle will come in at. Because then you don't want to be around them. Because they're offended about everything. You have to walk on eggshells. And it just, you know what I'm saying? So, that's another level in your walk with Christ. Okay? So, again, go to Romans 12, 10 and 1 Peter 5, 5. High regard for myself causes me to refuse to admit my wrongs. To get angry when my way is challenged and to reject correction. So the Bible never says grow in self-esteem. It often says grow in humility. So we need to just become more and more humble. Thus, for the godly communication necessary for healthy relationships, we must turn from evil and do good in our walk. Godly behavior is the basis for godly communication. Okay, godly communication requires that we turn from evil and do good in our words. So again, we talked about our walk. Let's go back now. So the first one we talked about was um, was turning from evil in our walk, right? So it requires turning. Then we talked about doing good in our um, communicating, not just in turning, but actually turning from evil in our walk. Let me just clarify that. So when we're walking our walk with Christ, 
and let's say we're doing some stuff that's not nice or not, you know, that's evil. We're turning from that and not just turning, we're going to do good in our walk. Okay. And so then, and doing good needs to be harmonious. We talked about this, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, humble in spirit. Now, godly communication requires that we turn from evil and do good in our words. Do you desire life and love to see good days? That's Peter, 1 Peter 3, 10, second part, uh, 10b. Keep, stop your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Godly words built on a godly walk will yield godly communication and relationships. Peter shows that we must turn from evil words that tear down and pursue good words that build up. A godly communication requires that we turn from evil words. So the times that we're living in, you guys know where I'm going with this. It's very difficult um, sometimes, but it is what it is. God is still requiring us to speak a certain way, and I struggle with that. I'm not going to sit here and say that I... I got this down pat um, we have to turn from our evil words if we're not going to say anything nice what do mama say don't say anything at all peter mentions two aspects of turning from evil turning from evil words means not retaliating from retaliating when we are verbally abused keep your tongue from evil as psalm 34 13 supports that verse right that we are not to return insult for insult, but rather to give a blessed inse blessing instead. This principle runs counter to the world, which says, if someone abuses you verbally, you don't have to take it. Stand up for yourself. Do what you need to do. Set them straight. Yeah, we have to not return um, evil for evil. We really need to, to just speak blessings on people. Luke 6, 28 says, bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Now, I'm not going to tell you this is easy. I'm not sitting up here trying to be playing, you know, holy roller or I just got all this together. I, I struggle every single day. I, I'm working on my salvation every single day. It is very difficult when you think, when you believe or think or whatever that someone is deliberately or even non-deliberately doing stuff that's annoying you or to mistreat you, not to retaliate. Okay. We're not talking here about clarifying misunderstandings or offering correction through proper communication. So we're not saying just let them say to do or do anything. There are proper times to state your point of view and speak the truth in a calm, loving manner. What's in view here is when a person is being deliberately abusive towards you. If they're being deliberately abusive towards you, then yeah, walk away. I'm not saying just stand here and take it. You walk away. And if you're not in a position to walk away, put your earphones on because, you know, but the whole point is just not to not to let them argue with themselves. First Corinthians four twelve. When we are re reviled, we bless. Proverbs fifteen one. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Okay. Turning from evil words means refraining from deception. First Peter three ten. Keep his lips from speaking deceit. Deceit was used by Homer to mean bait or snare. It refers to anything calculated to manipulate, deceive, mislead, or distort the facts. Deception is a barrier to healthy communication since it is self-seeking and it destroys trust. It may be a deliberate attempt to bend the facts to suit your side of the story. Or perhaps you leave out certain facts so that the other person get a skewed view of what really is going on, right? So you've heard this, her side, his side, and the truth. It may be telling a person one thing to his face but saying something else behind his back. Mm. That way, people side with you against that other person. It may be exaggeration. You always, you never, etc., etc. Paul says that we are to speak the truth in love, Ephesians 4, Ephesians 4, 15. Truth without love can be insensitive, harsh, or cruel. You have some people who, who speak truth and some people just speak love. You got to bring them together. Love without truth is mushy, weak, and misleading. We need both in balance. Now, I realize that there are difficult situations where it is hard to be truthful. We've all been there. It's just hard to tell people the truth sometimes because of what's going to come with it. But you have to deliver truth and love. You know, do you like my hair, dude? If you know somebody is, you guys know what I'm saying. If you know you got a sister or a brother who's um, going through and they went to get their hair done or whatever to try to make themselves feel better. And then they ask you, you're not going to tell them that their hair is told. You know, <sighs> it's hard. You know, and I can't tell you what to say in that instance. You know what I'm saying? It's just, 
you know, you always want to speak truth and just say, you know, well, okay, I don't know what to tell you to say, right? But you guys understand what I'm saying. It's very difficult, but you always want to, you don't want to lie to the person, okay? So godly communication requires that we do good by blessing others with words that build up. Okay, it's not enough to hold your tongue when someone says something offensive to you, but you need to retaliate with words.